everyone and welcome back to Neetopedia that is Neet ka encyclopedia and today is second part of chapter 2 electrostatic potential and capacitance and today we will be dealing specifically with dielectrics and capacitance uh, in the last audio book of that is the part 1 of this video we had dealt the electric potential and also we had pointed out all the important lines of the NCRT from which questions could be framed or which has been asked in our previous year questions and we will be doing that too in this one also. Also before proceeding I would like to give you one short information that our telegram channel per every morning four questions are being given that is from physics, chemistry, botany and zoology one question per subject and those questions are very highly prone to silly mistakes like aise questions jisme bachche bahut jaldi silly mistake karte hain aur negative marking kar sakte hain so if you want to reduce your silly mistake please make sure that you practice those questions link of the channel is in the description now without wasting our time let's begin chapter 2.10 dielectrics and polarization dielectrics are non conducting substances in contrast to the conductors they have no or negligible number of charge carriers Recall from section 2.9 what happens when a conductor is placed in an external electric field. The free charge carriers move and charge distribution in the conductor adjusts itself in such a way that the electric field due to induced charges opposes the external field within the conductor. This happens until the static situation. The two fields cancel each other and the net electrostatic force in the conductor is zero. In a dielectric this free movement of charges is not possible. It turns out that the external field induces dipole moment by stretching or reorienting the molecules of the dielectric the collective effect of all the molecular dipole moments is net charges on the surface and of the dielectric which produce the field that opposes the external field unlike in a conductor however the opposing field so induced does not exactly cancel the external field it only reduces it the extent of effect depends upon the nature of the dielectric to understand the effect we need to look at the charge distribution of a dielectric at the molecular level the molecules of a substance may be polar or nonpolar in a nonpolar molecule the charges the centers of positive and negative charges coincide the molecule then has no permanent or intrinsic dipole moment examples of nonpolar molecules are oxygen and hydrogen molecules which because of the symmetry have no dipole moment On the other hand a polar molecule is one in which the center of positive and negative charges are separated even when there is no external field such molecules have a permanent dipole and ionic molecules such as hcl or molecule of water are examples of polar molecules in an external electric field the positive and negative charges of a nonpolar molecule are displaced in opposite direction the displacement stops when the external force on the constituent charges of the molecule is balanced by the restoring force due to internal fields in the molecule the nonpolar molecule thus develops an induced dipole moment the dielectric is said to be polarized by the external field we consider only a simple situation when the induced dipole moment is in the direction of the field and it's proportional to the field strength substances for which this assumption is true is called linear isotopic dielectrics The induced dipole moments of different molecules add up giving a net dipole moment of the dielectric in the presence of the external field. A dielectric with polar molecules also develops a net dipole moment in the external field, but for a different reason. In the absence of any external field, the permanent dipoles are oriented randomly due to thermal agitation. So, the total dipole moment is zero. When the external field is applied, the individual dipole moments tend to align with the field when summed up over all molecules. there is then a net dipole moment in the direction of the electric field that is dielectric is polarized now please note here that this particular line is very important from theoretical question point of view that when the dipole moment is in the direction of the electric external field the dielectric is polarized moving further the extent of polarization depends on relative strength of two mutually opposite factors that is the dipole potential energy in the external field tending to align the dipoles with the field and thermal energy tending to disrupt the alignment there may be in addition induced dipole moment effect as for nonpolar molecules but generally the alignment effect is more important for polar molecules thus in either case whether polar or nonpolar a dielectric develops a net dipole moment in the presence of an external field the dipole moment per unit volume is called polarization and is denoted by capital p for linear isotopic dielectrics Capital P is equal to epsilon naught chi e capital E, where chi is a constant 
characteristic of dielectric and is known as electric susceptibility of dielectric medium it is possible to relate chi to the molecular properties of the substance but we shall not pursue that here the question is how does the polarized dielectric modify the original electric field inside it let us consider for simplicity a rectangular dielectric slab placed in a uniform external electric field e not parallel to two of its faces the field causes a uniform polarization capital p of the dielectric thus every volume element delta v of the slab has dipole moment capital p delta v in the direction of the field the volume element delta v is macroscopically small but contains very large number of molecular dipoles anywhere inside the dielectric the volume element delta v has no net charge though it has net dipole moment this is because the positive charge of one dipole sits close to the negative charge of the adjacent dipole however at the surfaces of the dielectric normal to the electric field there is evidently a net charge density as seen in figure 2.23 the positive ends of the dipole remain unneutralized at the right surface and negative ends at the left surface the unbalanced charges are the induced charges due to the external field thus polarized dielectric is equivalent to the two charged surfaces with induced surface charge densities say rho p and minus rho p clearly the field produced by these charges opposes the external field the total field in the dielectric is thereby reduced from the case when no dielectric is present we should note that the surface charge density plus minus rho p arises from bound and not free charges in the dielectric 2.11 capacitors and capacitors a capacitor is a system of two conductors separated by an insulator the conductors have charges say q1 and q2 and potentials as v1 and v2 usually in practice the two conductors have charges q and minus q with potential difference as v equals to v1 minus v2 between them we shall consider only this kind of charge configuration of the capacitor even a single conductor can be used as a capacitor by assuming the other at the infinity the conductors may be so charged by connecting them to the two terminals of the battery capital q is called the charge of the capacitor though this in fact is the charge on one of the conductors that is the total charge of the capacitor is zero now this is a very important line for you to note out it forms a main equation in while solving the numericals or you should be knowing here that the total charge on a capacitor is always zero as one plate is always positively charged and the other plate is equally negatively charged moving further the electric field in the region between the conductors is proportional to the charge capital q that is if the charge on the capacitor is say doubled electric field will also be doubled at every point This follows from the direct proportionality between the field and the charge implied by Coulomb's law and superposition principle. Now potential difference V is the work done per unit charge in taking a small test charge from the conductor 2 to 1 against the field. Consequently, V is also proportional to Q and the ratio Q upon V is a constant. That is C is equal to Q upon V. The constant C is called capacitance of the capacitor. and c is independent of q or v as stated above the capacitance c depends only on the geometrical configuration of the system of two conductors so this is very important though c is equal to q upon v but still q does not depend on q or v it only depends upon the geometrical configuration of the system so please note it down and highlight it in your book Moving further, the SI unit of capacitance is 1 farad which is equal to 1 coulomb per volt or 1 farad is equal to 1 coulomb CV. A capacitor with fixed capacitance is symbolically shown as here while the one with variable capacitance is shown as this. Equation shows that for a large C, V is small for a given Q. This means a capacitor with large capacitance can hold large amount of charge at a relatively small potential. this is of practical importance the high potential difference implies strong electric field around the conductors a strong electric field can ionize the surrounding air and accelerate the charges so as to produce oppositely charged plates thereby neutralizing the charge on the capacitor plates at least partly in other words the charge of the capacitor leaks away due to the reduction in insulating power of the intervening medium The maximum electric field that dielectric medium can withstand without breakdown is called its dielectric strength. 
For air, it is about 3 into 10 to the power 6 volt per meter. For a separation between conductors of order 1 cm or so, this field corresponds to the potential difference of 3 into 10 to the power 4 volt between the conductors. Thus, for a capacitor to store a large amount of charge without leaking, its capacitance should be high enough so that the potential difference and hence the electric field do not exceed the breakdown limits. Put differently, there is a limit of the amount of charge that can be stored on a given capacitor without significant leaking. In practice, a farad is a very big unit. The most common units are its submultiples, that is 1 microfarad, which is equal to 10 to the power minus 6 farad, or 1 nanofarad, which is equal to 10 to the power minus 9 farad, or 1 picofarad, which is equal to 10 to the power minus 12 farads, etc. Besides its use in storing the charge, a capacitor is a key element of most of the AC circuits with important functions. 2.12 Parallel Plate Capacitor A parallel plate capacitor consists of two large parallel plane conducting plates separated by a small distance. We first take an intervening medium between the plates to be vacuumed. The effect of the dielectric medium between the plates is discussed in the next section. Let A be the area of each plate and B is the separation between them. The two plates have charges plus Q and minus Q, where D is much smaller than the linear dimension of the plate and D square is very much less than A. We can use the result on dielectric field by an infinite plane sheet of uniform surface charge density. Plate 1 has surface charge density as rho equals to Q upon A and plate 2 has a surface charge density as minus sigma. The electric field at the different regions is that in the outer region it is as E upon e is equal to sigma upon 2 epsilon naught minus sigma upon 2 epsilon naught which is equal to 0. While in the outer region 2 e is also equal to 0. In the inner region between the plates 1 and 2 the electric field due to the two charges add up giving up as E is equal to Q upon epsilon naught A which is equal to sigma upon epsilon naught. The direction of the field in the form of positive to the negative plate. Thus, the electric field is localized between the two plates and is uniform throughout. For plates with finite area, it is not to be thrown near the outer boundaries of the plate. The field lines bend outward at the edges and an effect is called the fringing of the field. But at the same token, sigma will not be strictly uniform on the entire plate. E and sigma are related in the equation. However, d squared is very much less than E. These effects can be ignored in the region sufficiently far from the edges and the field there is given by the equation E is equal to Q upon epsilon naught A. Now for the uniform electric field, potential difference is simply the electric field times the distance between the plates that is V equals to ED which is equal to QD upon epsilon naught A. The capacitance C of the parallel plate capacitor is then C equals to Q upon V which is equal to epsilon naught A upon D which as expected depends only on the geometry of the system. For typical values like A equals to 1 meter square and D equals to 1 millimeter, we get that C is equal to 8.85 into 10 to the power minus 9 farad. This shows that 1 farad is too big unit in practice. As remarked earlier, another way of seeing the bigness of 1 farad is to calculate the area of the plates needed to have C equals to 1 farad for a separation of say 1 centimeter. So the area is equal to CD upon epsilon naught which is equal to 10 to the power 9 meter square which is a plate about 30 km in length and breadth. 2.13 Effect of Dielectric on Capacitance While understanding the behavior of dielectric in an external field developed in the section 2.10, let us see how the capacitance of a parallel plate capacitor is modified when a dielectric is present. As before, we have two large plates, each of area A separated by a distance D. The charge on the plate is plus minus Q corresponding to the charge density plus minus sigma, where sigma is equal to Q upon A. When there is vacuum between the plates, then E0 is equal to sigma upon epsilon naught, and the potential difference is V0 which is equal to E0 D. The capacitance C0 in this case is C0 is equal to Q upon V0 which is equal to epsilon naught A upon D. Consider a electric dielectric inserted between the plates fully occupying the intervening region. 
the dielectric is polarized by the field and as explained in the previous section the effect is equivalent to the two charge sheets at the surfaces of the dielectric normal to the field with surface charge densities as sigma p and minus sigma p the electric field in the direction the dielectric then corresponds to the case when the net surface charge density on the plate is plus minus sigma minus sigma p that is e is equal to sigma minus sigma p upon epsilon not so the potential difference across the plate is v equals to ed which is equal to sigma minus sigma p d upon epsilon not for linear dielectrics we expect rho p to be proportional to e not that is rho sigma thus sigma minus sigma p is proportional to sigma and we can write that sigma minus sigma p is equal to sigma upon k where k is the constant characteristic of dielectric clearly k is greater than 1 we then have v is equal to sigma d upon epsilon not k which is equal to q d upon a epsilon not k the capacitance c with dielectric between the plate is then written as q c equals to q upon v which is equal to epsilon not k a upon d the product epsilon not k is called permittivity of the medium and is denoted by epsilon where epsilon is equal to epsilon not k for vacuum k is equal to 1 and epsilon is equal to epsilon not epsilon not is called the permittivity of the vacuum with the dimensional rest ratio that is k equals to epsilon upon epsilon not is called the dielectric constant of a substance as remarked before it is clear that k is greater than 1 k is equal to c upon c not thus dielectric constant of a substance is the factor by which the capacitance increases from its vacuum value when the dielectric is inserted fully between the plates of the capacitor though we are right at the equation for the case of parallel plate capacitor it holds good for any type of capacitor and can in fact be viewed in a general as a definition of dielectric constant of a substance I'm skipping example 2.8 for you to solve it later or you may pause the video and solve it right now. 2.14 combination of capacitors. We can combine several capacitors of capacitance C1, C2 and so on till Cn to obtain a system with some effective capacitance C. The effective capacitance depends on the way the individual capacitors are combined. Two simple possibilities are discussed below. 2.14.1 capacitor in series. Figure 2.26 shows capacitors C1 and C2 combined in series. The left plate of C1 and the right plate of C2 are connected to two terminals of a battery and have charges Q and minus Q respectively. It then follows that the right plate of C1 has charge minus Q and the left plate of C2 has charge Q. If this was not so, the net charge on each capacitor would not be zero. This would result in an electric field in the conductor connecting C1 and C2. the charge would flow until the net charge on both c1 and c2 is zero and there is no electric field in the conductor connecting c1 and c2 thus in the series combination charges on the two plates that is plus minus q are same on each capacitor the total potential drop v across the combination is the sum of the potential drops v1 and v2 across c1 and c2 respectively that is v is equal to v1 plus v2 which is equal to q upon c1 plus q upon c2 that is v by q is equal to 1 upon c1 plus 1 upon c2 now we can regard the combination as an effective capacitor with charge q and potential difference v the effective capacitance of the combination is c is equal to qv if we compare both the equations then we obtain that 1 upon c is equal to 1 upon c1 plus 1 upon c2 the proof clearly goes through for any number of capacitors arranged in a similar way the equation for n capacitors arranged in series generalizes to v equals to v1 plus v2 plus and so on to the n which is equal to q upon c1 plus q upon c2 and so on to q upon cn following the same steps as for the case of two capacitors we get the general formula for effective capacitance of a series combination of n capacitors that is 1 by c is equal to 1 by c1 plus 1 by c2 and so on till 1 by cn 2.14.2 capacitors in parallel figure 2.28a shows two capacitors arranged in parallel in this case same potential difference is applied across both the capacitors but the plate charges 
plus minus q1 on capacitor 1 and the plate charges plus minus q2 on capacitor 2 are not necessarily same that is q1 is equal to c1v and q2 is equal to c2v the equivalent capacitor is 1 with charge q equals to q1 plus q2 and the potential difference v that is q is equal to cv is equal to c1v plus c2v the effective capacitance c is then c equals to c1 plus c2 the general formula for effective capacitance c for parallel combination of n capacitors follows similarly q equals to q1 plus q2 and so on till qn that is cv is equal to c1v plus c2v and so on till cnv which gives us c is equal to c1 plus c2 and so on till cn i'm skipping example 2.9 for you to solve it later or you may pause the video and solve it right now 2.15 energy stored in a capacitor the capacitor as we have seen above is a system of two conductors with charge q and minus q to determine the energy stored in this configuration consider initially two uncharged conductors 1 and 2 imagine next a process of transferring the charge from conductor 2 to conductor 1 bit by bit so as that at the end conductor 1 gets charge q by charge conservation and conductor 2 has charge minus q at the end in transferring the positive charge from conductor 2 to conductor 1 work will be done externally since at any stage conductor 1 is at a higher potential than conductor 2 to calculate the total work done we first calculate the total work done in a small step involving the transfer of an infinitesimally small amount of charge consider the intermediate situation when conductors 1 and conductor 2 have will have charges q dash and minus q dash respectively at this stage the potential difference v dash between the conductor 1 and 2 is q dash upon c where c is the capacitance of the system next imagine that the small charge delta q dash is transferred from conductor 2 to conductor 1 work done in this step is delta w resulting in the charge q dash on conductor 1 increasing to q dash upon delta q dash and it is given by delta w is equal to v dash delta q dash which is equal to q dash upon c delta q dash since delta q dash can be made as small as we like it can be written as delta w is equal to 1 upon 2 c into q dash plus delta q dash whole square minus q dash square the equations are identical because this term of the second in order of delta q dash that is delta q dash square upon 2c is negligible since delta q dash is arbitrarily small the total work done w is the sum of small work delta w over a very large number of steps involved in building of the charge q dash from 0 to q thus v is equal to sum of the all the steps of delta w and finally by calculating the entire equation we get that w is equal to q square upon 2c same result can be obtained directly from the equation by integrating w and w is equal to q square upon 2c. This is not surprising since integration is nothing but the summation of a large number of small terms. We can write the final result in different ways that is w is equal to q square upon 2c which is equal to 1 by 2 cv square which is equal to 1 by 2 qv. Since electrostatic force is conservative, this work is stored in the form of potential energy of the system. Now please note that this statement is really important as for the conservation of energy. You can see that electrostatic force being a conservative force is converting the work potential energy of the system. So the work done is always stored in the form of potential energy of the system that is the work done by the electric force is stored as the potential energy of the system in the case of capacitors. So if a theoretical question comes up from here, I hope you will be clear with that. For the same reason, the final result for potential energy is independent of the manner in which the charge configuration of the capacitor is built up. When the capacitor discharges, the stored up energy is released. It is possible to view the potential energy of the capacitor as stored in the electric field between the two plates. To see this, consider for simplicity a parallel plate capacitor of area A of each plate and separation D between the plates. Energy stored in the capacitor is equal to half Q square upon C which is equal to A sigma whole square upon 2 into D upon epsilon naught A 
surface charge density sigma is related to the electric field E between the two plates as E is equal to sigma upon epsilon naught. From the equations, we get that energy stored in a capacitor U is equal to 1 by 2 epsilon naught E square into AD. Note that AD is the volume of the region between the plates where the electric field alone exists. If we define energy density as energy stored per unit volume of a space, it shows that energy density of electric field U is equal to 1 by 2 epsilon naught E square. Though we derive the equation for the case of parallel plate capacitor, the result on energy density of an electric field is in fact very general and holds true for electric field due to any configuration of charges. Now please note that this equation has been asked in your AIPMT and NEET for almost 2 to 3 times. So just mug it up. I'm skipping example 2.10 for you to solve it later or you may pause the video and solve it right now. Summary should be dealt by you yourself or if you go through the summary you will get the briefing of the entire chapter by your own. I'm skipping directly to the points to ponder which is very important section for making theoretical questions of physics. Points to ponder Number 1. Electrostatic deals with the forces between charges at rest. But if there is a force on charge, how can it be at rest? Thus, when we are talking of electrostatic force between charges, it should be understood that each charge is being kept at rest by some unspecified force that opposes the net coulomb force of the charge. Number 2. A capacitor is so configured that it confines the electric field lines within a small region of space. Thus, even though the field may be considerable strength, the potential difference between two conductors of a capacitor is small. Number 3. Electric field is discontinuous across the surface of the spherical charge shell. It is zero inside and sigma upon epsilon naught outside. The electric potential is, however, continuous across the surface. That is equal to Q upon 4 by epsilon naught R at the surface. Number 4. Torque P cross E on a dipole causes it to oscillate about E. If there is a dissipative mechanism, the oscillations are damped and the dipole eventually aligns with E. Now please note that this fourth point is very very important and it has been asked in previous year questions. When you are solving previous year questions, please note the theoretical lines of the questions very carefully and you will find this particular point in one of those questions. Potential due to the charge Q at its own location is not defined, that is, it is infinite. Number 6. In the expression QVR for potential energy of a charge Q, VR is the potential due to external charges and not the potential due to Q. As seen in point 5, the expression will be ill-defined if VR includes potential due to charge Q itself. Number 7. Cavity inside a conductor is shielded from the outside electrical influences. Is it worth noting that electrostatic shielding is not work the other way around? That is, if you put charges inside the cavity, exterior of the conductor is not shielded from the fields of the electric charges. So that's the end of the audiobook. I hope you enjoyed listening to it and do comment your feedback down in the comment section. See you again in the next one. Till then, stay tuned and subscribe to the channel. Thank you.